This is the Ether Review, a talk show passing the components of the Ethereum global computing platform and its ecosystem. Building on a basic knowledge of the blockchain, we seek to understand the mechanics behind this new generation computing network and the services it powers. Some of the discussions featured on the show will be technical, while others will be much higher level. Show notes, credits, and links can be found on Twitter at Ether Review. Please direct any feedback or follow up questions through that platform. For formal communications, contact at etherreview.info. Our guest today is Joseph Lubin. Um, so, my name is Joseph Lubin. I'm one of the founders of the Ethereum project um, and also founder at a company or a a uh, constellation of companies uh, that we're calling Consensus. Um, Consensus is a group of uh, a little bit north of 50 people around the world uh, building decentralized applications and tools and doing some consulting work um, all at this point uh, for the Ethereum ecosystem. So uh, my background is kind of diverse. Um, it uh, mostly been in in the fields of technology as well as finance, uh, usually their intersection. Uh, so I did research in robotics and machine vision, neural networks um, for a, a few years after college. Did quite a bit of software engineering for different companies uh, using different technologies. Ended up uh, uh, running a software project in the private wealth management division of Goldman Sachs for a while. And then I was fortunate enough to be asked to join a friend of mine in starting up a, a hedge fund. And so we did that for a little while. And uh, I guess I gained my exposure to the, the financial world most deeply through that project. Um, after that, uh, did various other software and financial endeavors. I spent some time uh, with a friend working in the music industry in Jamaica was aware of the Bitcoin starting in 2011, tracked it, um, bought a bunch, traded quite a bit, and didn't really want to get involved in any sort of um, Bitcoin-related company. At, the, at that time, it was a lot of pretty amateur projects uh, with immature technology, and those things have been sort of swept from the system by, uh, by security consultants um, who... Uh, set their own uh, consulting fees, basically remove their consulting fees from, uh, from those particular companies and unfortunately from some of their customers. When I first encountered Bitcoin, um, I had the understanding that this was going to change everything, that it was going to be a force for universal disintermediation. But it wasn't until well, I talked to Vitalik and read the white paper, um, I guess right at the end of December 2013, where I really saw uh, tangibly how that vision could be crystallized. And so at that point, I was still in Jamaica and decided that uh, I had to change things up and become part of the Ethereum project. What was it about Ethereum that uh, piqued your interest? Well, Bitcoin is a technology that's basically got four components, um, four core components. It's, uh, it's got a cryptographic token. Um, it's got peer-to-peer -peer networking system, a consensus formation algorithm, and it's got a virtual machine. Uh, the virtual machine of the Bitcoin virtual machine essentially enables you to run very, very simple scripts. And the only real core functionality, the only real core feature that the Bitcoin system offers natively um, is the ability to, to transfer that token and store that token. So it's really a single money application. And certainly there are groups around the world that are building layers on top of Bitcoin, stuffing data into 80 bytes, um, sort of like they did in the 60s, and erecting, sc erecting scaffolding of cryptographic primitives to, to try and maintain security above that narrow Bitcoin protocol. Ethereum is all those same components, except the virtual machine is computationally complete. And so it was really clear to anybody who read that white paper that suddenly you could build arbitrarily complex software uh, that would get run uh, in a virtual machine of every single node on the Ethereum network. And so that was, uh, uh, that was the key insight, basically. Don't provide 
a system with a bunch of built-in features at the protocol level, um, build a featureless system, and enable anybody to build anything they want to. So, Joseph, were you interested in decentralization before you discovered Ethereum, or is uh, is decentralization as a subject uh, or as a concept? Is that something that you think is native to to Bitcoin and and the Ethereum kind of ecosystem? So, I was interested in in decentralization before Ethereum, certainly, um, and I believe my interest began with Bitcoin in earnest, uh, but but certainly. Um, was aware of technologies like BitTorrent, and I understood some of the power of decentralization in, in peer-to-peer networking systems. But I, I would say it took Bitcoin uh, for me to see the potential universal ramifications. Uh, before that, I guess I felt that there was a need for something, a need for change. I, you know, the financial world was in disarray, and it looked like um, things were going to be very difficult economically in many regions of the world just because there was so much debt compared to the amount of money that existed to to pay down that debt. And so one of two things would happen. You'd either have a race to the bottom in terms of the value of the currencies so that uh, governments and companies and people could pay off their debt with devalued uh, fiat currency. Or you'd get a cascading collapse where those same kinds of entities could not pay their their debt. And uh, eventually uh, things would fall apart either in in a slow cascade or maybe a quick nonlinear difficulty. (laughs) Difficulty. That's a uh, that's a euphemism and a half. Cool. So, I mean, do you feel like your time in uh, hedge fund management contributed to that understanding? Absolutely. So for most of my life, I really, I thought those people who took economics in in college were wasting their time. I was very happy being a technologist and that was pretty much the world that I cared about. I did not care much about politics or economics. Um, Right around the time that that I started working at Goldman, uh, late 90s, that's when I started paying attention to those things and, and got deeply into it. As, you know, um, major events in the world happened. 9-11 was a crystallizing event for a lot of people um, and caused a lot of people to introspect on many different things that were going on in the world. And and it certainly caused me to do the same. And when you say introspect on what's going on in the world, how do you, um, how does that introspection feed into your decision to get involved with Ethereum and your uh, attitude toward I hesitate to use the phrase decentralization movement, but the um, decentralization as, a, as an idea that's, uh, that's becoming culturally relevant. Sure. So maybe it's best to call it a phenomenon. I think it's a natural thing that's happening. I think uh, it's a natural thing that is, has been enabled by technologies that were pioneered essentially by centralized top-down command and control companies and governments. Uh, so they brought this upon us, um, thankfully, and they also triggered the need for it. Essentially, monetary policy, um, corporate policy, um, how corporations um, govern themselves, how they deal with people's data, how they treat their customers, all of those things, uh, certainly how governments treat their customers, how central banks um, construct monetary policy and and aspects of the economy. I think all of those entities have done a spectacular job so far in bringing us to where we are. Um, but now that I believe they've enabled us to go further, and, and by that I mean providing roughly the same kinds of services and better services, but doing so in a less intermediated um, context. Intermediation is a really great thing, but because of the various frictions in our society, regulatory, legal, physical, um, siloed power, siloed information, all of those things enable incumbent intermediaries to extract far more value uh, than what they're adding to specific transactions. And so by creating a, an excellent but not ultimately efficient system, and also by creating 
communications, many, many layers of communications networks that uh, span the globe and uh, with a technology like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which essentially enables us to make decisions collectively uh, in seconds among a group of global actors. Um, all of those forces, I believe, have, have conspired to uh, bring this decentralization phenomenon forth. So um, how does Ethereum, and uh, with its complete scripting language and distributed architecture, how does it serve the demand for a new solution that you foresee? Um, Ethereum has the capability of being uh, that substrate that, uh, upon which social and economic systems globally, digital um, economic systems can be built. It mechanistically makes all of this possible. Um, it also, uh, as essentially an open architecture, uh, an architecture where it's relatively easy to share information and uh, to use other software components on the system, it can effectively uh, enable um, information to be de-siloed. Uh, so, for instance, Deutsche Bank could potentially use the same software infrastructure as Bank of America. And since every transaction is cryptographically uh, secure and verified, uh, those two entities could be using the same system, storing their data separately and uh, effectively reducing um, the redundancy that, that we see in so many of these systems. So was this what Ethereum was built to be? And what are the theoretical underpinnings that, or theoretical breakthroughs that allow it to uh, solve these problems? Well, I think Bitcoin made um, some of the key theoretical breakthroughs. Um, Basically, uh, the blockchain as a data structure, uh, the cryptographic token. We saw cryptographic tokens before Bitcoin, but there, there was no way really to solve the double spending problem. So Bitcoin made that critical breakthrough. The real critical breakthrough that Ethereum um, represents was Vitalik's understanding that, well, I guess a lot of us um, were looking around for what would be the Bitcoin 2.0 solution, the generalization of the Bitcoin protocol. Entities like Next and Counterparty took an expedient route to that, and they built a few features in at the protocol level. But in order to expand that system, you really were relying on the core developers to add a new feature. Vitalik's critical understanding was, let's generalize this whole thing, let's build a system that's powerful enough so that anybody could add their own features, any sort of software engineer with pretty average coding skills, pretty average understanding of, uh, of back-end and front-end, could simply um, build what they want to build. And so that, instead of uh, three counterparty core devs um, furiously trying to build new features, you could have 30,000 software developers furiously building new features onto Ethereum. Um, so uh, it's really uh, it's the featurelessness of Ethereum uh, and turning it into a next generation, basically uh, computer programming stack. Um, and we've, uh, uh, Ethereum itself has built some development tools. Uh, Yuri Mat Matias has built some uh, a framework that's, uh, that's very interesting. We at Consensus, uh, Tim Coulter, has built a framework that's very interesting. Um, a few consensus projects, um, one of which hasn't really been released yet, but uh, is in extensive testing. It's basically a web-based IDE um, that uh, Roman Mandalay's team has built. Uh, we're putting together essentially a new software stack and tools for making software development easy decentralized application development easy. And I'm really starting to get the sense that it's going to be easier than building a web application just because uh, you're not really going to have to think about database too much. Uh, like certainly on some hybrid applications, you'll have to do that. But uh, a lot of the hosting and database structuring issues just go away. Um, so uh, unlike Bitcoin, really, um, you're not just able to store tokens in a ledger, you're able to store uh, software, uh, computer executable computer code in the Ethereum ledger. 
And then in order to invoke that code, normally it just kind of sits there dormant. Uh, if you want to interact with that program, you simply send that program a transaction, just the way you would send Bitcoin from one person to another or Ether from one person to another. And so that program is what we've been calling a smart contract. Exactly. When you say it's stored on the blockchain or it exists on the blockchain, is the program itself, is the contract, is the code itself stored on that uh, highly redundant, highly distributed global ledger? It, it is indeed. Um, the compiled and executable code is stored uh, um, as part of the state of the Ethereum system. So they're generally in order to, unless you're Vitalik, you, you write uh, a program in a higher level computing language. Um, and so there could be potentially a disconnect uh, or the opportunity to even fool people if you don't present um, both the readable source code uh, as well as the executable code in the same place. And so um, Roman Mandalay's team and, and some others at Consensus are working on uh, ways of essentially presenting what the source code was. So, so a developer would have to do this. Um, present the source code, indicate uh, what uh, version of the compiler compiled it, indicate what version of Ethereum it's, it was tested for and run for, uh, and essentially uh, you can verify that uh, this particular program, which purports to do certain things, uh, corresponds to this program on the blockchain at this address as transformed by the compiler essentially and now this is uh, this is actually bringing us to a um, to a, a question I wanted to get to a bit later, but I may as well attack it right here how do you uh, how do you scale a system with that much data being stored in it sure uh, so all of these uh, blockchain systems face a few different scaling issues. Um, one is uh, how many transactions can you process per second? Another is how much data can each node reasonably store? Ethereum is, is orders of magnitude more efficient than Bitcoin in terms of how it's storing data, but it's also probably going to be orders of magnitude more demanding in terms of how much data uh, will need to be stored. Uh, and, and even in terms of transactions, I think we, we did a stress test. I think we hit around 30 transactions per second. Um, I think really Bitcoin's pretty much limited to three and a half uh, at this point. So there are a few pathways to scalability. Uh, one, um, there's a pruning system being built. Two, for version 2.0, one mechanism of, of scaling the system will be to shard address space and have subsets of, of uh, transaction verifiers or miners process a subset of transactions and have another subset validate that, uh, so a disjoint subset of validators validate uh, those transactions. The first step before even that happens is moving to proof of stake. So currently there are, I don't know, maybe 10,000 nodes on the Ethereum network. That's, that's a, just a guess, really. Um, hash power has gotten pretty, pretty, uh, high pretty fast uh, in the in a, like just a few weeks, six weeks, basically. So instead of burning all of that electricity in and doing an enormous amount of, of useless computation, not really useless because you're, you're running the system, uh, I would say uh, um, it's far more efficient than, say, the uh, Federal Reserve System and commercial banking system in the United States. Um, but uh, essentially, instead of um, burning all that electricity and wasting time and requiring um, 15 seconds for a block to be validated and, and transmitted, etc. Um, we are going to move to a proof-of-stake of system, um, likely the Casper system um, that Vlad Zamfir and others are working on. Uh, and essentially that will designate a set of of stakers, basically, you'll you'll put up a security bond, um, and you will validate transactions uh, when you're called upon. So, perhaps a hundred validators or so will be called upon every n seconds uh, to validate the transactions that they're seeing. Um, so that that's step number one. Uh, it is 
possible um, with a system like that to to have block times that are um, much much less than fifteen seconds. So instead of uh, instead of using proof of work to uh, to decide what or what isn't a a valid block, you're going to be using a uh, a bonded validator model that basically has people who have something on the line deciding what and what isn't a valid transaction. Am I getting that right? Yeah, that's that's exactly correct. This reminds me of uh, other architectures we've seen, like Dash and uh, maybe even a little bit like delegated proof of stake in uh, in BitShares. Is that in some way inspired? Do you think there's a general uh, a general trend toward an ideal network? Well, it is indeed similar to other proof of stake systems out there, uh, and we're doing a ton of work. We'll do a ton of simulation work to make sure we we get it uh, as right as it possibly can be. In terms of architecture, I think it's probably going to... Oh, we think we've made the optimal decisions. The one big problem with proof-of-stake systems is um, the initial issuance problem. How do you fairly assign a whole bunch of tokens? And so if, you, if a small group of entities have all the tokens at the start and they are the ones who are staking and validating, then um, they're going to retain a large percentage of the tokens for a long time. So uh, Ethereum, as you know, conducted a crowd sale that was done instead of taking money from VCs. And we talked to quite a lot of VCs and, and there were many that were interested. But that was done so that we could essentially get the tokens in as many hands as possible. It ended, ended up that uh, over 9,000 transactions were done in that sale, um, purchases of Ether. And so that was, that was in line with our goals for, for uh, inclusiveness. Um, the second element of inclusiveness is, is essentially to run proof of work for quite a while because if you've got a GPU or you want to buy a GPU, that's really all you need uh, in order to start uh, earning a whole bunch of ether. Um, another great way of earning a bunch of ether is to write some software. Um, so ideally, we're we're writing a lot of software. There's a bunch of groups around the world that are that are writing um, programs and services. And ideally, the ether will end up spread out even more uh, as more and more software developers start to earn it. Uh, 12, 15, maybe 24 months uh, from the launch of Genesis, uh, there will be a, trans- a transition to proof of stake. Ideally, Ether will be spread better than it is now, uh, hopefully much, much better. Um, and um, proof of stake can commence having had a relatively fair uh, initial issuance of the token. So this sounds like you've looked at the pitfalls that we've seen other projects stumble on, uh, particularly with issuance. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin itself, oh my God, it's incredibly concentrated. And then you've, you've adapted the network and, the, and your proof of stake execution so to anticipate those problems. Um, we're, we're doing our best. Any, any sort of project in its early stages obviously has concentrated governance and ownership. Um, whether it's a private company or uh, a project like Ethereum, an open source project like Ethereum. Um, so you know, we're, uh, there was no obvious perfect solution, and we did our best to, to build the most inclusive solution. So moving on to consensus, is, is it a company? Now, I mean, I know you have the Ethereum Foundation, and then Consensus is another organization that you're involved with, and a lot of the core developers are involved with. I wondered, could you please explain the relationship between the two? Sure. Um, so I did a lot of work um, on the Ethereum Foundation um, for many, many months. Uh, around October of last year, I and a very small number of people started Consensus, and we've been growing it since then. Um, Consensus is a little bit north of 40 people located on four continents. A bunch of us are in New York City. A bunch of software developers are in New York City. Um, And we are building decentralized applications and we're building tools and we're doing some consulting. I'm not officially involved with the foundation, though I talk to lots of people that are um, running it or 
um, are, are also advisors to it. Um, and uh, consensus is certainly supportive of, of a strong foundation trying to even help craft its future. Um, it's looking like the future of the foundation will be uh, pretty research oriented, um, but uh, Vitalik's zeroing in on on a pretty crisp plan. So I should probably just leave that uh, to him to articulate uh, when he's ready. That'll probably be a week or two away. Consensus uh, has, I guess, two core developers. Um, and those would be Roman Mandalay and a, a gentleman named James Hormuzdiar. Um, they're sort of unofficial versions of Ethereum. They're one of the things the foundation has to do in the fairly near term is to define exactly what is meant by an official Ethereum implementation. Uh, my feeling is that that needs to be done by a suite of tests. So if effectively, if you uh, pass the entire suite of tests, then maybe the foundation rubber stamps your implementation as official. So uh, Roman Mandalay, who runs EtherCamp, um, they've delivered uh, the EtherCamp blockchain explorer and a forthcoming IDE. Um, he is the primary developer of the Ethereum Java version, and Jim Hormoz DR is the developer of the Haskell version, which most people don't hear much about. But uh, I think it's an exciting version just because Haskell is effectively executable mathematics. And so being able to prove uh, things, um, uh, verifiability will be a powerful characteristic of a system that could end up being the substrate of economic and social systems, especially if banks are looking to use a system like that, like that for their own internal networks. Um, um, Proofs will be very interesting to them uh, if you're building layers and layers of financial architecture on top of that. Now, another thing, I read a, uh, I read a post on Discus that you made uh, six months ago, um, and you mentioned that you're thinking about a limited runway for Ethereum and that you thought you might be developing additional projects. Um, I think in the, in the post itself, you, you said... Um, Possibly extern, extern, uh, some of the low-level utility dApps, for example, name registration, may garner sig significant re revenue. Could you uh, expand on any other projects that are going on or any potential revenue streams that Ethereum might be the beneficiary of before that runway um, reaches its terminus? Sure. So um, Ethereum has, at the foundation level, there, there's a decent runway. Um, without any appreciation in the Ethereum token. Um, I would say if, if Ether is, stays at a dollar, it's got at least uh, a year of runway uh, before it starts to absolutely need cash infusions. Uh, that said, there are plans to attract capital in the form of donations or grants uh, to Ethereum. Um, so the runway is it's something to... Um, think about and um, certainly uh, try to lengthen it, um, but it's not absolutely critical at this point. There are, first of all, I'm not making any decisions for the Ethereum Foundation or for FDEV. Um, FDEV is run by uh, Vitalik and Gavin and Jeff and um, things like uh, NameReg, uh, the global registry system. Uh, those are under their control, and if they choose to to turn that thing into a revenue generator, that's their decision. Uh, I'm not sure. I I don't really have any opinion either way on whether that's a good idea or not. I think uh, maybe just the game theoretic aspect of of registration um, should um, require some sort of uh, payment, um, but. Uh, um, the FDEV and, and the foundation will build some cool tools, but I think they're really going to mostly focus on um, research, the research required to build a scalable system, as well as just bringing the different core implementations, which are currently uh, Python, Go, and C++, um, 
towards uh, a 1.1 release and a 2.0 release, and uh, also um, put the Mist uh, graphical user interface version of Ethereum out to, as soon as possible. Um, that, that said, uh, we at Consensus are actually building a bunch of those things that I was talking about. So we're building wallet, we're building ID, uh, persistent ID, persona systems, we're building reputation systems, we're building registry systems. So we're going to put those things out there both for human use or corporate use where, let's say, you need to register uh, something, um, land perhaps, or we're building a a poker system. We might want to register all the users in our poker system. So those kinds of things will be both for use directly from the website for people as well as um, just software components that other decentralized applications can make use of. Now, just uh, touching on something you said there about Ethereum 2.0, and I also wanted to go back to the uh, to the question of scalability. Now, we talked about scalability of transactions with the uh, with the bonded nodes. I'm wondering what will um, what will Ethereum 2.0 look like? How will it look different? And um, how will uh, and what kind of uh, storage requirements are going to be made of nodes? Um, it, it's a hard question for me to answer because it doesn't exist yet. And uh, there are still research projects which need to be taken further. Uh, once the research indicates specific directions are uh, most fruitful, then a huge amount of simulation will be done. And so um, Vitalik, Vlad, and some others will be doing that work. Um, I, I can't... I don't think Ethereum is going to look radically different, uh, but certainly uh, it was our goal to basically build a demo system, uh, get 1.0 out the door. Um, 1.0 is going to be totally scalable for a year or two years. It'll be just fine. Um, it, it's a system that enables us to learn how to, to build this these crazy new things called decentralized applications to to deal with the user experience of 15 second block times to learn how to build a decentralized business um, to some sort of figure out what those business models might be. Um, so 1.0 is plenty for a while and ideally we get wildly successful and um, there becomes a, a real burgeoning need for 2.0 scalability. Um, but really as 1.0 gets more and more used more and more popular uh it's not like transactions are gonna fall to the floor um it's a market basically so if uh if you really need your transaction to be processed um then you simply raise the fee that you pay to miners Uh, so um ethereum 1.0 will be able to handle things for quite a while this is uh i'm touching on some i may be getting a bit um a bit tangential here but you mentioned the the fundamental um, importance of disintermediation earlier on, and you and just as you were saying now, as we approach the uh, the limits of scalability, ultimately the the free market uh, for um, for transaction processing that the proof of work miners provide should take care of that um, additional traffic um, by just by just taxing it. Sure. So, do you feel that this is a um, a way of replacing the uh, the market free zone of the corporation or the government um, or the intermediary essentially, and turning that intermediary into a fully free market uh, territory. Absolutely, that's really well said. Um, essentially, uh, Ronald Coase, uh, an economist, uh, won a Nobel Prize for his theory of the corporation and. And he was thinking about the corporation in terms of how big can it possibly get uh, while remaining efficient. Um, And and basically, um, that was defined by um, the cost of the marginal transaction. So um, if it got to a point where it was um, too big so that the marginal transaction uh, was more expensive than what could be done out in the open market, um, then that was the appropriate size or to, to stop building the company, basically. But uh, um, those kinds of organizations, governments, militaries, 
corporations. Um, they all are built with top-down command and control uh, infrastructure. And that's done because uh, that was the appropriate choice because communication has been slow and decision-making has been slow because of that. Those amazing top-down command and control institutions have built uh, webs of communication networks and uh, essentially we can speak to each other. I'm guessing you're in the UK right now. We can speak to each other instantaneously over how many different kinds of communication channels right now. Um, the, the Bitcoin uh, consensus formation algorithm enabled people, um, 49% of whom could be malicious, uh, to make a decision every 10 minutes on average. Uh, the Ethereum system has, in, has brought that down to every 15 seconds on average. So in that sort of context, the corporation or, or the organizational unit that delivers a project can shrink up dramatically. So. Uh, it does indeed start to look like every little entity that's delivering a product or service um, is very narrowly focused, and anything that isn't in their core competency is outsourced to the free market, as you indicated. And Ethereum is an ideal substrate for that. Uh, consensus is actually uh, formed on that principle. Consensus is not one big monolithic organization. It doesn't have top-down command and control. It is essentially a constellation of loosely coupled, quasi-independent and interdependent projects. Um, and each of our projects are actually going to have blockchain governance. So we're building tools like Boardroom, uh, tools like WayFund, token issuance and management. And those entity or those those software tools will enable us to run our many different interconnected businesses on the blockchain it, in basically the, arch, the architecture that you described. Basically, um, it's a, a lot of little entities in a free market. And I think uh, in terms of setting the correct price uh, for intermediation, um, the best way to do that is not in a, an infrastructure that's frictional, um, but uh, to use the price discovery mechanisms of a massively decentralized free market. At that point, intermediation is perfectly priced. Thanks, Joseph. Also to Rob from the Bitcoin game and Jared Hope, both of whom helped put this together. Next week, Jared and I chat with Vlad Zamfir about the Casper proof-of-stake consensus algorithm a variant of which is intended to eventually take over from the proof-of-work consensus used by the Ethereum network today.